I'm Stephanie, and this is The Cool Part Show, the show all about interesting 3D printed parts. Today, we're taking you into the heat of competition to talk about the design and testing of this part, a 3D printed multi-tool. This multi-tool was designed, engineered, sliced, 3D printed, post-processed, and tested by a team of college students as part of a national competition. The tool had to be able to complete a variety of very specific tasks, it had to be made out of steel, and it had to be 3D printed. The winning multi-tool for the 2025 Additive in Steel competition on this episode of The Cool Part Show. Welcome to The Cool Part Show. Thanks for tuning in. If you like the show, make sure to subscribe to the channel on YouTube and hit the bell icon to get notified about all of our new episodes. Today we are talking about this 3D printed multi-tool, the winner of the 2025 Additive in Steel competition. This was the second year for this competition, which is sponsored by America Makes, a public-private partnership that aims to advance additive technology and education in the United States. Additive in Steel is part of a group of contests that are organized by the Steel Founder Society of America along with Cast in Steel and Forged in Steel. So for this year's competition, teams were challenged to reimagine a multi-tool, a hand tool that can serve multiple functions. So it's not just a pocket knife, not just a screwdriver, not just a hammer, it can be all of these things and much more. This challenge was inspired by the needs of field service technicians in the defense industry. So college students were invited to reimagine what a multi-tool could be, uh, try to come up with a design that could make the best use of additive manufacturing while also being very, very functional. Uh, the design had to be most made from steel and they had to use 3D printing to do it. So here's how this played out. Teams of college students from around the country had from February to April, just about two months, to design, engineer, and manufacture their multi-tool. Students were encouraged to consult with EMTs, firefighters, military personnel, anyone who might have a need for a tool like this in their daily life. Most teams also worked with an industry partner that could assist with the additive manufacturing and more of the technical aspects of this competition. The teams were evaluated on their design process, their manufacturing, uh, how well they documented the entire workflow, and they were scored by a panel of judges from across the additive manufacturing industry, including representatives of various companies and end users and the media, Hi, that's me. Uh, we scored the teams based on all of those factors leading up to the competition as well as how their multi-tools actually performed in use. The five teams that made it to the finish came to Forge Fair, hosted this year in Cleveland, and they demonstrated their tools on stage in front of a live audience. Every team had a representative that had to take the multi-tool through all of these different tasks. They had to remove several different types of fasteners, cut a wire, cut a seatbelt, hammer a nail, pry open a paint can, break a pane of glass, and open a bottle. We were there to document the entire process. We got to talk to the teams as they were competing, and we want to play some clips from that now. A quick word about that, the Additive in Steel competition, the, the multi-tools were being tested alongside the Forged in Steel competition, which asked college students to develop a forging hammer. So you are going to hear some hammering noises in the background of some of these clips. Uh, so we drew heavy inspiration from like the Leatherman skeletal tools and other things for the kind of mechanism where it can swing open and then lock shut to be pliers like that. Um, but overall we wanted a single device that didn't require any additional um, attachments or things and could fold up into a nice compact form factor. All of our tools uh, functioned pretty much as expected. We had a couple of slight hiccups with like the seatbelt cutter um, and needing an extension for the um, Allen head. But other than that, our, our Phillips head screwdriver worked great. It broke the glass, opened the bottle, opened the paint can. So overall it went pretty well. Um, I guess we ran some that was uh, easy to hold uh, and then be able to use everything as well as the hammer. We used uh, lattices to help reduce, reduce the weight of it so it wasn't just one big solid piece. And then uh, on the inside of these lattices we have a generative design we use to give it more strength and then we just surrounded that by lattices to give it some extra uh, just factory safety to make sure it's strong as if it's needed for anything that it encounters. Uh, our seatbelt cutter didn't work but that was a weakness we kind of we knew and if someone was going to fail, it was going to be that. We wanted it to be on uh, one or two pivot points for all of the tools to swivel out on. It started with one, but we ended up with two pivot points for all of the tools. So. And that's, that's one of the, cha or the challenges we face with material extrusion is our original design started off a lot more complicated, so we had to simplify it because of the capabilities of our machine. So. What we really worked on is uh, reducing part counts, right? So if you look at a regular pocket knife, how many parts are on it? Like 10, 15, 20, and all of those are from different places. So 
with an insert. What right? you can do with yeah. this is um, print almost the entire thing in one go in one machine, yeah, right? Good. Every single screwing operation well, is done by this one tool arm. And the thing is we designed it so you can take both the bits we printed and any standard hex bit. Right. If we were to continue with this, just to make it more convenient, we would have like a plastic sheath around the tool itself so we can attach the bits directly to yeah. it. Oh, yeah. So it's yeah, just yeah, interchangeable yeah. like that. Um, there were a few areas that uh, worked really well. Uh, the uh, Allen wrench part worked well. Socket worked really well. Um, Phillips. Uh, one thing is our uh, flathead is a bit too thick, so it didn't want to fit in there. So thankfully the socket was able to get that. So that last clip featured Brandon Bays, part of the team that developed this tool, the Redbird Tinkerer Tribe from the University of Louisville. So you saw a little bit of how this tool performed in testing, but let's rewind and look at the story of how the team got here. Here's one of Brandon's teammates, Tyler Thomas. So we began our design process by researching traditional multi-tools. We wanted to do something similar to this, but simplify it to make it easier for additive manufacturing. So we started looking at tools like this, which are just pure functionality, nothing extra, but we didn't want quite that simple. So we looked at a combined one part tool, such as these fencing pliers that already had a hammer, a hex wrench, pliers or a pry and operated with intuitive plier action. So initially we planned for some modularity with reversible tool ends, but we eliminated that idea for simplicity. This was the first um, basic geometry that we decided on. Basically, we have our hammer over here, flathead, hex wrench, wire cutter, socket receiver, seatbelt cutter, bottle opener, Allen key, and Phillips. We decided to combine some functionality, so our Phillips head was going to be our glass breaker. Our flathead would also be the pry. So the Redbird Tinkerer Tribe went into this challenge thinking about simplicity, how to make the most compact and simplest multi-tool they could think of. One of the contest requirements was that the collapsed multi-tool had to fit within a three and a half by six and a half inch rectangle. So as the team was figuring out how to incorporate all of these different tools, they were restricted on the total size of the multi-tool and had to take that into account. We just looked at the list of requirements. We, we thought, how can we fit all these tools just kind of on the perimeter of just, just a flat shape? Um, and we tried to get the, the plier action in there too, just for the wire snippers, just to make that easy to use. Um, so yeah, we just kind of went on SOLIDWORKS where we made paper sketches first and just drew out where each of the tools would stick out and then made a 3D model and, and just went from there. So to take our ideas off of paper and onto CAD, uh, we set out to make a few different designs. Uh, this one focuses mainly on the hammer, uh, whereas this one focuses on this seatbelt cutter aspect of the design. Uh, and then this one takes care of everything else. So our goal was to take all these ideas, put them into one part. So once the Redbird Tinkerer Tribe thought they had a workable design, they weren't quite ready to jump into 3D printing just yet. They wanted to do some simulations and try to confirm that their design was actually going to function in the real world. Team member Obadi Alaga led this part of the project. Oh, so you also did FES simulation using SOLIDWORKS and you applied a 40 pound force on the split faces to mimic the turning force and you found out that the deformation was negligible. So during the simulation we were interested in finding out whether our tool would fail. So we applied a 40 pound force toward the top and bottom over the inner side and the other side. And you also found that the deformation was negligible. That proved that our tool survived everyday usage. So once the team was satisfied with their design and the simulation results, they moved into physical prototyping with polymer fused filament fabrication, or FFF, um, using PLA to make a model of the actual tool. But they knew the entire time that the final multi-tool was going to be manufactured in steel using laser powder bed fusion. And so optimizing, translating that PLA design into something that could be made through powder bed fusion involved a fair bit of optimization just for that specific process. And that led them to have to contend with warping. The, the warp on FDM was similar to what our metal part turned out. Um, in FDM, uh, it kind of helped inform like support strategy. Um, so on the FDM when we print it, for example, the hex would be like squashed because the sports would peel up. Um, and we would get, you know, not the right dimensions that we were looking for. Uh, so that really like helped, it taught us like, okay, here's a part that we need to make sure we support well. We don't want it peeling off. 
So we made a few modifications to our FDM printed part so that we could print it in metal on our EOS machines. Uh, we made this test print so that we could benchmark certain design features. So this is the first benchmark part that we printed. It's got a noticeable warp to it due to built up thermal re residual stresses. As you can see on the socket receiver, that warpage caused a deformation that threw the dimensions off. And the same thing happened on the Allen key. So warping continued to be a struggle throughout the development process. The team speculates that a heat treat step while the part was still on the build plate might have helped. Some other changes happened as they got into that laser powder bed fusion process, including the addition of these lattices that were designed with materialized to help lightweight the tool, remove some of the material. Another particularly challenging aspect of this multi-tool is the pivot point. So there is no assembly involved with this multi-tool. This is all 3D printed as one piece. And so they had to do some optimization. They had to do some thinking about how to be able to print that joint so that things were close enough together that the tool could be self-supporting, but far enough apart that they'd be able to get that plier action. So teammate Justin Gillum worked on the support strategy that made that possible. Since we're essentially printing two sides, like straight on top of each other. We, we started with uh, one test print, so we printed a full plate of different uh, spacings. And then in addition to that, off to the side, we also printed a full part with the smallest tolerance. It didn't move, so <laughs> try as we might, that wasn't the way to go. I believe the one we have now is 350 uh, microns. So the dovetail strategy and the support structures worked. They were able to 3D print the multi-tool as one assembly and get the plier action working almost right off the printer. So the Redbird Tinkerer Tribe was able to successfully 3D print their multi-tool in 316 stainless steel using an EOS M290 laser powder bed fusion machine. But one important note here, while steel had to be the primary material for the multi-tool, teams were free to use off-the-shelf hardware and incorporate some other materials as well. So the Redbird Tinkerer Tribe, like many of the other teams, opted to use an off-the-shelf blade for the cutting task. Uh, and so to incorporate it, they actually used a second additive manufacturing process, directed energy deposition, or DED, with a machine from Adup, and a second material, a little bit of Inconel that's used to enclose the blade into this area right here. So while the integration of the blade went just fine, there was something else that happened in post-processing that ended up affecting the performance of the blade in testing. We also did a uh, sandblasting process afterwards to clean it up. And uh, I feel like that is probably what contributed to the blade being a bit dull. If I was doing this again, I'd probably try to cover that blade before doing that. So the dull blade did cost the team in the practical test. They weren't able to cut the seatbelt, and so they had to take a loss on that particular task. However, it wasn't enough to set them back too much. The judges panel was impressed with the streamlined design of this multi-tool and how the team incorporated design for additive manufacturing, DFAM principles, to make the overall manufacturing process simpler. So taking all of the factors of the competition into account, the Redbird Tinkerer Tribe came out on top. Uh, first place is the University of Louisville, the Redbird Tinker Tribe. What was the experience like of competing in AM and Steel? It was, it was pretty cool, some pretty like entertaining tests, entertaining ways to use the tools. I've enjoyed being here at the convention um, and yeah, just not only watching the additive part but also the forging, uh, just kind of getting a bit more immersed in that uh, realm as well. Um, test was fun. Uh, I enjoyed seeing the other teams. Uh, I've seen some really good parts from everyone else, so just been having a good time. So to recap, this multi-tool was created as part of the 2025 Additive in Steel competition. It was submitted by the Redbird Tinkerer Tribe from the University of Louisville. It is 3D printed 316 stainless steel using laser powder bed fusion, and then an off-the-shelf blade was added and enclosed using DED and a little bit of Inconel. The final multi-tool takes advantage of additive manufacturing's benefits for things like lightweighting as well as assembly consolidation. So that's it for this episode of The Cool Part Show, but congratulations to all five teams that competed at Forge Fair. The Artist Slicers from the Colorado School of Mines, the Powder Pros, the Slicing Units, and the Jack of All Tools, all from Grand Valley State University, and of course the Redbird Tinkerer Tribe from the University of Louisville. Thank you to America Makes for the invitation to be part of the judging and for the opportunity to capture this on camera. We had a lot of fun at the event and meeting all the teams and it was just great to be there. So if you'd like to learn more about additive manufacturing, maybe you wanna see more cool parts or maybe you'd like to enter the additive and steel competition next year, check out the links in the show notes. 
And if you have a cool part that you'd like to see featured on the show, email coolparts at additivemanufacturing.media. Thanks for watching.